here for the city. And I want to extend thanks to the Interstate Chemicals Clearinghouse which is a consortium of organizations and agencies that come together to talk about how we can find safer alternatives and conduct alternatives analyses, et cetera. Um, and IC2 normally doesn't have these webinars open to just anyone. They're, it's usually meant for members. So I really appreciate the IC2 offering this up to folks who are not members. And I hope you'll consider looking into what IC2 does and see if it might work for you to become a member. So um, as I said, I'm Jen Jackson, and as many of you probably know, firefighting foams are one of the largest uses of fluorinated chemicals, or per and polyfluoral alkyl substances, PFASs, and they are known and suspected sources of many contaminated drinking water and groundwater sites globally. So many state and local governments, as well as private companies operating fire suppression systems, are learning about the potential harm to both their workers and the lasting environmental damage that fluorinated foams may pose. So many may want to make the switch to other kinds of foams, but as we dive in, we realize there are a lot of considerations to take into account. And so that is exactly where the city of San Francisco is right now. We've been researching the various different considerations. And so I'm here along with my colleagues from the city to learn right along with many of you. And I'm honored to introduce our expert panel of speakers who will inform all of us. And our hope is that at the end of this webinar, you'll better understand why fluorinated foams are a concern, what is the regulatory landscape, and we'll hear from people who have either made the switch to other foams or have helped others make the switch and to learn about what those considerations may be for making that transition, whether it's what alternative do you choose, what kind of training do you need, what kind of equipment, what are the costs. So without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker. Dr. Ian Ross is the technical, Senior Technical Director of in situ remediation and technical lead of global PFAS at Arcadis, which is an international design and consulting firm for natural and built assets. His sole focus for the last five years has been PFASs, and he has published several articles as well as a book chapter on PFASs in the Emerging Contaminants Handbook. He has experience with many types of treatment, treatment technologies and has won several awards for designing innovative treatment approaches. Ian. Thanks, Jen. So I'm gonna provide an overview of um, PFASs from an environmental perspective uh, to provide a backdrop to the presentation. So on the next slide, you'll see um, that there's a, a potential safety issue. We normally start our meetings with a safety moment as part of our health and safety culture. And this is our foam safety moment in that Gumtree is like Craigslist, it's a advertising platform. And this is in Australia where Steve in Darwin has got 13, 20 liter drums of firefighting foam that happen to be the, the older type of foam with PFOS in it that he's trying to sell. So it's just be aware that um, foam disposal should be incineration, but uh, you may find um, other options are becoming available for people trying to dispose of foams. So on the next slide, it's just an overview of um, the presentation um, where we look at um, what PFASs are in foams, what regulations are happening, pragmatic approaches to assessing the environmental footprint of um, fluorine-free foams, etc., and some feedback from fluorine-free foam users. So on the next slide, let's just talk about the specific characteristics of PFASs as to why we're perceiving they're a potential problem. So there are a few things with regard to these chemicals that come together in that they tend to be pretty water soluble, so they're mobile in the environment, meaning they can travel um, some distance in surface waters or groundwater. They're not really showing any sign of meaningful biodegradation, so um, <clears throat> they're extremely persistent, have been termed forever chemicals. Some of them are surfactants, so they can coat surfaces, and that means they can become a reservoir for continued release from where they've been deposited to ground. And they bioaccumulate or biomagnify up the food chain and in humans, so um, they concentrate in uh, higher organisms. So um, humans especially have um, a, an issue with renal reabsorption, so we fail to excrete them, whilst other animals can excrete them at faster rates. And then as a result of the, the bioaccumulation potential in humans and the perception of toxicity, we have extremely low drinking water standards, which are evolving. So PFAS is, as a, 
in the next slide as a class as a whole class there's about 4730 parent compounds identified by OECD last year so some of them are called perfluorinated and this is what we used to have as PFCs and they're the common things we're looking for in groundwater mostly and the next shows that a lot of them are called polyfluorinated and that means these are what termed fluorotelomers and they can be precursors to the perfluorinated so the next click shows that what's commonly regulated and the next one should demonstrate that really in the environment these precursor molecules which tend to be uh, proprietary and not necessarily have their formulation revealed they're in the the foams that we're using the modern foams especially and they tend to form the perfluorinated compounds when they're released into the environment by microbial attack or by higher organism by transformation if they're ingested so the next slide really just to focus on what foams we're concerned with there's a lot more interest in, in AFFF but class B firefighting foams that contain PFAS include these fluoroprotein FP foams and triple FP and also their alcohol resistant variants so there's three types of these foams not just AFFF so on the next slide what we've seen is some um, like P PFOS and PFOA have been replaced uh, by a series of <clears throat> other chemistries and these tend to be fluorotelomers now these these don't biodegrade either they transform in the environment to make more of these um, pfcs or perfluoroalkyl acids the perfluorinated varieties and there's more and more information coming out that there are you know multiple intermediates in this transformation process that potentially exhibit toxic effects which we don't know much about there's evidence of some of these intermediates bioaccumulating in rats and potentially in invertebrates and the shorter chains also are accumulating in crops so I think there's concern here that the replacements are potentially more of an environmental threat and they're more mobile in the environment they're more difficult to treat and so what we're seeing is a shift in focus from regulation where bioaccumulation is a focus because that's protecting the food chain to mobility which is perceived now to be more important when you're protecting drinking water supplies which are principally the concern when you come to PFASs at the moment so in Germany they're adopting a persistence mo mobility and toxicity or very persistent very mobile criteria to assess the safety of chemicals so next slide please so as I said it's a complex mixture we have standard analytical methods which are used based on what's termed US EPA method 537 which is adapting to to include more and more of these acronyms but the bottom line is the acronyms here are not in the foams and so you'd need more advanced analytical methods to find what's in the foams and work out its environmental footprint where it is on a site uh, your source areas and really characterize the foam itself and where it is going on the site and some of these methods include the total oxidizable precursor assay which on the next slide really that shows that what this is doing is um, it's converting these precursor molecules to perfluoroalkyl acids similar to those that are going to form in the environment then you can detect them indirectly and so now this is widely available commercially and really essential when you want to look in at firefighting foams to work out what's in them so uh, several labs available this is where this is available across the world now in Europe Africa um, North America etc so the next slide shows some of the data from the top assay where this was published in 2013 by Erica Houts and it shows that analysis on the left shows before top assay is done and really we could find the PFOS which was in the older foams um, but in the newer foams there was nothing there and after the top assay this is the only time you actually start to see what's in these fluorotelomer foams and you see an increase in what was in the older foams with a lot more of the um, the, the C6 compounds the PFHXS precursors coming out here so really it's important to use this when you're considering analysis of firefighting foam so on the next slide the concern has been over the past decade um, that drinking water standards are going down and this is driven by what are termed tolerable daily intake levels and in the table we can see how these have decreased especially in Europe it's quite marked decrease from 150 to 1.8 and 1500 to 0.8 recently 
So these drive the drinking water standards, which seem to be going down and down. And on the next slide, we've got a plan of the world just showing who's regulating what, where, as far as we can. Um, I point out the really US EPA, long-term health advisory of 70 nanograms per liter, 0 0.07 micrograms per liter. Really, Vermont adopted a 20 um, nanogram per liter target, then expanded that to five different um, compounds. And we're seeing different parts of the world adopting different values. So in Sweden and Denmark, it's the, the sum of 12 of these um, perfluoroalkyl acids, which have to be below 100 or 90 nanograms per liter. Um, in New Jersey, the, the MCLs have been set at 13 and 14 nanograms per liter. And in California, we're seeing even lower numbers with six and a half and 5.1 nanograms per liter coming out. The lowest I'm aware of so far is Denmark, where they're proposing three nanograms per liter for PFOS in drinking water. Um, so we are seeing a sort of a race to the bottom and more and more alcohol acids regulated. And we think we, we need to see some pragmatism sometimes with um, the shorter chain compounds in Minnesota and in Baden-Württemberg are regulated to much higher levels because they don't bioaccumulate. And then in, in Australia, the top assay is widely used and it's been used by regulators in Queensland uh, even to validate remediation methods. So we're certainly seeing it being adopted more and more in different countries. So on the next slide, there's just a bit of a snapshot of um, what's happening in the States again, with various levels coming in and MCLs being passed in multiple states here with New Hampshire, New York, Vermont, and New Jersey, um, with MCLs that are lower than the US EPA health advisory level. Um, but we just continue to see more and more regulations advance that we have to update this every month at the moment. So next slide. So when you're considering changing foams, I think one of the concerns is what's in the fluorine free foams and uh, what environmental footprint does that actually comprise um, if we're gonna release this to ground. So we now have a solution that's just about to be published before Christmas, which is a green screen certification system where the, the foam manufacturers have submitted all of their ingredients under a confidentiality agreement and clean product action have looked at all the criterion and looked at how toxic bioaccumulative, looked at all the aquatic toxicity data, and they've come up with a, a scoring level to say there's a bronze, silver, or gold level, meaning you can have um, confidence that whatever's in the flooring free foams has been assessed independently and is now certified as being you know, environmentally compliant, it will biodegrade in the ground and um, it can be used with confidence. So the next slide. And I think a lot of the point with, with looking at how we perceive risks from chemicals is to do with the criterion by which we judge them. And so the point with chlorine free foams is they have 100% biodegradable ingredients and it's similar to spilling milk. You're always going to get some kind of fish kill by something very biodegradable going into a static water feature like a pond, say, and there's not much we can do about that in terms of there'll be an effect from any foam, and that'll be as a result of the glycols in the foam, which are present in all these foams. There are higher glycol concentrations in the fluorinated foams than the non-fluorinated foams, so they will exhibit a worse effect potentially as far as a fish kill. But the difference between the fluorine free is and the fluorinated is the fluorine free don't contain any persistent chemicals, so there's no PFAS. You've got everything in there is like milk, a natural product that will biodegrade over time. So the next slide. Really just a comment and we're seeing, you know, the older foams were phased out and we moved from a PFOS foam around 2002 um, into foams that were about 20% PFOA precursors. Um, and then we moved towards um, C6 pure foams, which are out now, which have less PFOA precursors in them. Um, and as we're seeing more and more focus on this, I think we're seeing more of an evolution of fluorine free foams via multiple testing regimes and they're getting better and better so now we're having much more confidence that they can pass tests which uh, neil's going to talk about so on the next slide i just point out that if if i'm going to trust someone's advice regarding how well fluorine free foams work i'd trust someone that really has been using them for a long time and that uh, is lars anderson from the royal danish air force who's published that uh, he's very comfortable with them after using them for several years uh, 
If he was a crew member trapped in an aircraft, he would trust the fluorine free foam. He's saying they work flawlessly in two major incidents, using it for training. And from his point of view, there's no difference when compared to the old AFFF. So he's been successful using this now for several years. And that's the sort of advice I would trust in terms of um, how well these foams work. And on the next slide, just point out that multiple sectors like this is civil aviation uh, have been moving to fluorine free with many airports like across Australia and Europe um, have moved to fluorine free and there's an article here which describes that and my final slide is just a summary really of um, the main points where they're increasingly be found in drinking water um, PFAS is increasingly of concern um, the firefighting foams don't contain the uh, PFAS is we find in drinking water, they contain the precursors, so you would need some kind of advanced analytical technique to really identify what's in the, uh, the fluorinated foams and then what's in the environment as a result of their spill. And PFAS regulations are becoming more comprehensive to cover more of these compounds and more conservative. And for transitioning to fluorine-free foams, you know, green screen certification is available. It will be at Christmas. And we're seeing many sectors transitioning or have already transitioned to fluorine free foams. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian. Our next presenter is Nigel Holmes. He's Principal Advisor for Incident Management for the Queensland Department of Environment and Science, which is the regulatory body for pollution management in Queensland, Australia. Since 2012, he's been the project coordinator and author of Queensland's firefighting foam policy. And from 2016 to 2019, he has implemented their foam policy to help those using foams transition from persistent foams to sustainable, non-persistent alternatives and practices. Nigel. Hello, everybody. Um, next slide, please, Jen. Um, yes, uh, I think Ian's done a lot of my work for me here, um, so I'll... Uh, I'll cover off on uh, our Queensland experience in uh, transitioning from persistent foams. Um, Queensland has a very wide diversity of foam users. It's probably no different to any other country. So the heavy industries, uh, refineries, fuel storages, um, as well as the, the ports, mine sites. We have a particular issue with, with mining. Um, most of our foam users are distributed across the, uh, the landscape along the coastal fringes as well as interior for the mining in particular. So um, we, we came to a realisation um, that uh, we had a problem with firefighting foams back in about 2011, so I started to look at that. Um, to give you some context from the environmental perspective, which has already been covered to an extent, um, environmental characteristics of firefighting foam are actually very uh, simple and it's basic for all foams. All foams need to be managed, so no farm, uh, foam is environmentally friendly. So if anybody advertises their foam is environmentally friendly, be very, very uh, suspicious about that. Um, class B foams, which is what we're talking about, um, we split them as non-persistent and persistent. And obviously the PFAS issue within the persistent group is, uh, is fairly significant. When you look at the, uh, the split between short-term and long-term effects, the short-term effects of aquatic toxicity uh, is very low for all foams, so there really is no great distinction there. They're all practically non-toxic to relatively harmless on the scale that's shown there. And the oxygen depletion potential, which is your biochemical oxygen demand, is all very high for all foams. So there are differences there. So the, the fluorine frees tend to have a, a narrower range and a slightly lower um, BOD average um, for BOD 20 to 28, if you want to split hairs about that. But the real issue is the long term, uh, whether or not you have persistent organic pollutants in there, and PFAS has, has certainly hit the headlines in recent times. And it's about persistence, the long-term toxicity, um, by accumulation, by concentration up the food chain as well. Next slide, Jen. So from Queensland's point of view, um, there was certainly an emerging awareness of PFAS awareness since about 2000 when 3M started to make noises about getting out of the business. It's definitely not a, a new risk, PFAS, and not a, a new problem at all. But we have been caught a little bit short in being late to recognise the risks. 
Um, certainly that's been hampered by emerging information has been confounded by a lack of information, misunderstandings and even misinformation involved. Um, but in any case, uh, the need to phase out has become very clear because of the high socio-economic health and environmental costs across a, a very broad range of, of values. How we transition was then the next problem. So what were the priorities? How should we go about this? Uh, given that um, we we're already uh, heavily using uh, PFAS related uh, materials in firefighting firms and in other areas, it must be said. Next slide, Jen. So the drivers for change in the scale of effects uh, was really quite startling. It wasn't just a case of yeah, we had one effect. Um, the really important things that stood out from a socio-economic economic point of view was the drinking water sources, fisheries, crops, livestock. The clean-up costs were starting to bite as well, and most certainly the reputational uh, costs for, uh, for particular industries as well as politically um, were a big driver. And health impacts, of course, are important to, to everybody. And if, uh, if that doesn't motivate you, then <clears throat> certainly the legal actions that have been growing might well be uh, uh, a bit more motivation. Um, the very high cleanup costs, I think, was something that was really emerging. Um, Ian's covered off on what PFAS are. I don't like the term personally. It's very confusing. Um, but nonetheless, uh, the only message that we have is that all are or transform to indefinitely persistent perfluorinators at the end of the day. And you really must get away from thinking about, oh, it's only PFOS, PFO and PFXS. That's something that I find a lot of the time that people think it's really only that, that sort of small range of, of compounds. Um, I think at the Stockholm convention meeting uh, not that long ago, the Swiss came up with a, the number of 4,730 um, PFOA related compounds. So I think there's at least about 5,000 related compounds there. And the issues are that they're indefinitely persistent at the end of the day. Um, the toxicity is there one way or the other. Uh, by accumulation, by concentration, and above all, they're highly dispersive. They just don't seem to go away. Next slide, Jen. So uh, what was the, the issue? Um, we started off thinking about PFOS and PFO and PFXS uh, and then realised there was an analysis problem because the standard analysis only measures about 20 to 40 uh, compounds. It's a bit like fingerprints. You have to have a match to be able to measure it and the end's covered off on that. Um, I think in uh, material I've read associated with firefighting foam alone, there's about 200 to 600 PFAS uh, compounds associated with foam. So that's what's in the, uh, the foam, such as the fluorotelomas on the slide there are, are sort of some of the feedstocks there with various carbon chain lengths. Uh, and then you have the transformation products, which can include things like ketones and aldehydes and other things which we don't know a lot about apart from the generic sort of information we have that says we really should be concerned about those sort of, uh, sort of compounds. <clears throat> the legacy foams were relatively simple. They were sort of PFOS based and had some PF PFOR and certainly plenty of PFXS in it. <clears throat> but the newer generation foams were less understood and so a more inclusive analysis uh, method was needed and this is where the, uh, the top assay came in because it conveniently converts the hidden fluorotelomas hidden to the uh, standard method into the measurable carboxylics. Um, and that's the basis that we use to assess risk. Uh, the carbon chain length is a surrogate uh, for risk as far as we're concerned. It's the best thing that we've got so far. Next one, Jen. So there's uh, uh, just a brief mention of the top assay. There's been a bit of sort of argument about, um, well, the original method doesn't really work. Uh, the reason for that being the high organic content in foams especially interferes with the oxidation so you don't get a complete oxidation of the precursors to things that you can measure. But um, I have to say the method is now refined to take into account the organics and there was a recent um, uh, study done uh, through the Australian Land and Groundwater Association and that report's available that says uh, uh, how we get around this and it's not just foams but you also things like uh, sewage and biosolids where we're concerned about the PFAS concentrations. So the, the top assay is indicative of the foam fluorotelma chain length distribution after a little bit of interpretation which is which is illustrated in the pie charts there because uh, 
chlorotelomers are all uh, even chain and the top assay uh, results will give you some odd chains but you have to sort of um, interpret that to uh, back to what they would have been uh, most likely in the, uh, the even chain um, source fluorotelomers. There's also the total organic fluorine by uh, combustion ion chromatography check on the total um, organic fluorine content and possible losses at either end of the scale. <clears throat> but for firefighting foam, the top assay is uh, very useful because it's uh, covering off on the C4 to C14, which is more or less the sort of chain distributions that you get in foam. Next one, Jen. So the Queensland foam policy, we, uh, we looked at uh, development and said we've got to balance up the various safety, performance, cost and environmental issues. It's not just about the environment, which was an argument put to us to say, oh, all you guys are interested in is that. Our legislation requires that we consider all of that, including human health, because as the pollution manager, the reason we manage pollution is largely in the downstream effects on the environment and on uh, human health. So assessing the risk to values as inputs to setting priorities was, was one of the things that was quite difficult to do. And from that, we were looking at setting uh, achievable stages and timelines to transition because nothing can change overnight uh, with firefighting, especially with the bigger industries. And what do we do in the interim um, to, uh, to manage the risks while that transition is underway? And what's a reasonable time frame for it? Um, we also accepted that there uh, was likely to be uh, some residual contamination in systems um, because it's not reasonable to say you've got to rip out the whole system and, and put in a whole new clean system, um, just uh, not economically feasible. So all of that sort of got rolled into the, the policy and looking forward we also said well we're going to have an awful lot of waste generated out of this so what are we going to do with it and so we started to look ahead for disposal technologies which were very much in their infancy back in 2016. Next one, Jen. So the content of the, uh, the Queensland policy in a very basic sense, uh, the phase out over three years was decided. Initially, uh, two years was, was thought adequate, but uh, we consulted uh, quite widely with industry and said, okay, um, a lot of people can achieve a very fast transition if it's just a small facility um, that only has a few drums of foam versus your refineries um, and bulk fuel storages who have bigger problems. One of the other problems was also that um, the, uh, the alternatives weren't necessarily available in 2016. So there was an argument for a transition, at least in a temporary sense, to C6 foams um, if they were only uh, the only viable alternative at the time. Uh, and how do we certify those? Well, the top assay then came back into its uh, its own as well. Uh, and also allowing um, contamination levels for uh, for new foams to say, well, okay, in some facilities you might get some cross-contamination. There's also even been the issue of, of contamination from uh, contaminated water sources, for example, not so much in Australia. And then uh, what do you do with these wastes? Uh, how, do, how do you hold them and how do you dispose of them? was an issue. One thing that I would caution people about if they're thinking about foams is that um, just remember that a C6 based foam is not a C6 pure foam necessarily and that uh, analysis from the top assay at the bottom there shows you that the foam is largely C6 uh, or less but very significant proportions of C8, 10, 12 and a little bit of 14 there. So you have to be uh, very careful about saying all right if we're going to allow a C6 in a uh, a short term basis, then uh, it has to be a pure C6. Next one, Jen. Um, keeping on the theme of C6 and uh, regrettable substitutions that uh, has become a term that's uh, come into common parlance. Um, C6 was sort of thought to be the solution, but uh, emerging information suggests that no, all PFAS are, are a problem. And the advantages you might have with short chains in, in lower toxicity and lower bioaccumulation uh, levels is sort of countered by being far more mobile, far more uptake into edible portions of crops, um, much, much more difficult to remove in remediation. Um, and uh, other characteristics that uh, mean that they just keep cycling in the environment and in the food chain. Uh, and uh, that makes them particularly problematic. So um, from that 
perspective, we've decided that the the really PFAS are PFAS, and there's no real uh, difference in terms of the the risk. There's just different risk elements. Go for the next one, Jen. So for an indication of uh, global directions on PFAS and the future of C6 in particular, um, uh, the uh, Stockholm Convention is an interesting one, having been involved in discussions there. For the last uh, three discussions on compounds that we've had, uh, an unusual thing about the Stockholm Convention has been consideration of the broader family of the chemicals rather than just the single um, but individual chemicals that's traditionally uh, discussed. So the statement that sort of comes out is basically don't make that uh, regrettable substitution because uh, in the opinion of the review committee um, for dispersive applications of firefighting foam, such as firefighting foam, that the short chains are not so suitable. Next one, Jan. This just summarises uh, the policy. If, when you have the presentation, you can have a look at that later. It's relatively straightforward in terms of what must be transitioned and, ha and how to do it. Next one, Jan. Uh, make a brief mention about emerging uh, technologies for destruction. Um, we uh, looked at the options and uh, high temperature seemed to be what was uh, most likely to um, be available in some circumstances such as post furnace and traditionally 1100 degrees C was, was the number that was thrown around. Um, Standard methods of treatment such as wastewater treatment plants simply don't work for PFAS. They just pass through uh, like it's transparent. Next one, Jen. So standard high temperature destruction has got various problems. Mostly it's about potential release of hydrofluoric acid and flue gases. And there's also potential for residual PFAS to go through or for there to be reformation of short chains <coughs> in the flue gases. The next one, Jen. So what we facilitated was trials with cement kilns and um, that turned out to be a, a very good way to approach. Um, principally because the very high level of calcium in the system had some um, advantages. The uh, calcium makes the, uh, the PFAS destruction occur at a much lower temperature, so somewhere down around the 425 degrees to start off with. And it also strips out the fluorine progressively uh, into calcium fluoride, which uh, is insoluble, inert, and um, doesn't sort of remobilize. So that was uh, what we did with uh, Cement Australia, was run a, a trial of about 100 tonnes of 3M light water uh, very successfully with uh, no discernible emissions whatsoever. Next one, Jen. So to finish off, the that's become an ideal destruction methodology and I don't see any reason why uh, standard incineration can't incorporate uh, calcium into the system to strip out the fluorine. Uh, and the big advantage of that system is you have no endpoint waste that you need to scrub. It's inert. Um, it's uh, insoluble and it's locked up in the cement if you're using a cement kiln. Okay, Jen. Thank Great. you. Thank you so much, Nigel. I'm super interested in destruction, so thank you for addressing that. So our next speaker is Captain Kurt Plunkett. Captain Plunkett is with the Seattle Fire Department and he supervises engine, ladder, fireboat, and rescue boat personnel at fire, medical, and rescue incidents. In addition to developing employee training programs, Captain Plunkett conducts product research and develops policies. He has overseen the Seattle Fire Department's successful transition to a fluorine-free foam. Captain Plunkett. Well, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're at around the planet right now. So um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so the, my history was uh, I was assigned, I didn't volunteer for, I was assigned the project to look into switching over to some new foam. Uh, they were starting to think about the AFFF issues and the uh, environmental aspects. Um, but I'm going to give you a kind of a non-technical uh, overview. Uh, the environmental considerations were tertiary for us, um, even though we we're aware of the persistent bioaccumulative and toxic issues. 
we were wanted a foam uh, for multi-class fires that would work well for us. It dovetailed with us getting new fire boats as well as starting to equip some of our pumpers with uh, foam pro foam injection units, which were new to us. So with that happening, uh, we started shopping around for uh, new foams and uh, started doing some product research. Uh, next slide. So uh, we chose, uh, my, my employer wanted me to strip out the name of the exact product we use, but part of the name is Universal Extinguishing Foam. So we were looking at uh, the quote unquote new types of foams out there that were non toxic, non corrosive, um, some reported rapid cooling effects. Uh, we were glad to get uh, foams with no reportable hazardous substances and that would be compatible with other finished foams at incidents because within our jurisdiction we have tank farms, we have uh, airport crash rigs, we're still using uh, AFFF, AFFF alcohol resistant foams. So we had to make sure we could interface with them at incidents. Um, and additionally, realizing that municipal firefighters face a variety of, of fires, not just two-dimensional pooled fires, but three-dimensional fires and structures and at, in, at uh, incidents as well, so cascading, boiling, pressurized uh, um, fuels. We wanted to see if some of the claims these newer foams are making panned out. Um, what we ended up doing was selecting a foam that we can use at overhaul at 0.1% use. Uh, for multi-class fires, um, including uh, A, D, K, and Class B fires, including polar solvents. So uh, our big uh, push was going from a 3% foam to a foam with a lower use percentages meant our foam flow capabilities would go up, which was great because previously it was hard to implement, but with the advent of using direct foam portion injections, uh, it was much more uh, efficacy for utilizing the foam at structural fires, wildland incidents, as well as specialized incidents. Next slide. All right, typical structure fire with some exposures. And again, my perspective is more of a boots on the ground firefighting perspective, not so much the chemicals or even the cost issues. Um, next slide, please. So um, when we started to look at the, our foam choice, uh, we realized we want to use the standard recommended fire flows um, and uh, that uh, that would work great for us in structural attack. And then we also had to look at our class B attack issues. Next slide, please. So um, one of the things that drove us uh, to putting the foam proportioners on our apparatus, our pumpers, was a study that was published in Fire Chief Magazine that Los Angeles County did. I don't have the, uh, the exact uh, flow numbers here. I, I took it out. Uh, at the end of this or, or later, you can feel free to contact me by email and I can give you a FAQ sheet uh, and some of our training material if you want to assess uh, foam training issues and the use of newer foams. But based on LA County Fire Department's tests, uh, we were really intrigued. So we got some of the uh, foam and talked to different manufacturers and started doing some testing. Next slide, please. So uh, we did comparative testing over a number of years. Uh, at the time we started specking out our first new fire boat, we did some testing at the Grant County uh, Airport um, Aircraft Rescue Firefighting Facility, and within the next few years, additional testing at the Washington State Fire Training Academy. We did Class A fuel fires, Class D fires with uh, magnesium shavings and engine blocks, piled three-dimensional auto tire fires, we did ethanol fires, those were more two-dimensional, and we did a lot of Class B uh, fuel fires, both two-dimensional as well as uh, flowing 3D spray fires. And after evaluating several different products uh, that were available at different use percentages and had different claims from the manufacturers, we select our current uh, foam product. Um, one thing we found was uh, estimating some testing we had done on what our typical fire flow was for a Class A room and contents fire uh, that we're going to be spending about $9 per every room and contents fire. Um, our Class B use was estimated to be one-third to one-quarter the cost out the nozzle um, for the cost of using it for a Class B incident, and that's based upon the lower 
percentage uh, use in the in the fire stream. Next slide. So uh, some of the concerns with our fire investigators were that we we're going to have you know blankets of foam over everything. Um, here in Seattle, we weren't used to uh, foam and structural attack stuff. But we found a lot of information available from alcohol, tobacco, and firearms regarding fire investigation and the proper use of foam. And according to their information that properly applied, um, uh, that doesn't impede fire investigation and doesn't have an effect on uh, canine operations regarding cause and origin use, using a dog to sniff out accelerant use. Next slide. So uh, for us, uh, training was an issue because uh, it's hard to get our entire department and all the shifts to actually flow um, foam, and there's a cost to that as well. So uh, what we realized after doing research in some of our test fires that we didn't need any changes to our structural or wild, wildland attack practices uh, other than reviewing our new foam, foam proportioners and utilizing those uh, at fire incidents, making sure the drivers and relief drivers uh, were properly using foam proportioner. Um, we did need to review our class B fire attack practices. Um, and we only new equipment we got for our changeover was some aspirators for our two hand line size nozzles, just to clip the aspirators on the nozzle for additional aeration. Um, but we did need to train our people on how we'd be using this new foam. Some people thought it was a magic bullet, and we said, well, no, if you're overhauling post-fire, uh, you're going to need to uh, dig through, uh, use standard overhaul procedures, expose the char in uh, wood frame construction, uh, turn debris piles. You can just spray it on top of a collapsed roof and think it would magically put out all the Class A material Still smoldering underneath. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, so this is again uh, one of the slides we use in our training PowerPoint. Um, next slide. So for Class B firefighting, um, we utilized um, our fluorine-free foam that we selected uh, on both polar solvent and hydrocarbon fires, um, and we put together the training PowerPoint for our, our uh, personnel. And we did some filming uh, that we included video clips in our PowerPoint training that we delivered to the department uh, along with the uh, advent of utilizing our new phone choice. Next slide, please. So for Class B firefighting with our chosen phone, uh, we use it at 0.5% per the manufacturer's recommendations actually passed the UL testing at 0.45%, but underwriter laboratories wouldn't certify it for that. They said uh, no phone proportion equipment went down to that uh, uh, digit level, so they'd only certify it at 0.5 for Class B firefighting. And again, we had to uh, teach our people the difference between shallow spill fires and deep uh, cooled fuel fires and the different application techniques. Next slide. So spill fires was one version and one attack methodology we utilized. Next slide. And uh, deeper fires in tanks and pooled fires, um, a few inches deep or more, were going to require a different type of attack. Next slide. I don't believe, well, due to time constraints, we won't go through this, but we, we uh, did application um, techniques utilizing medium expansion nozzles, uh, low expansion, low flow standard nozzles, and we were able to extinguish uh, fuels cooled several inches deep with all the different uh, uh, with all the different equipment that we had. Next slide. I have to click off to the side. There we go. So for multi-class fires, which is really what municipal firefighters uh, tend to face, um, uh, we wanted to tell our personnel to you know, maintain vigilance if they knock down any pooled class 
uh, Bravo fires uh, to maintain a charge hose line, especially at ship fires and marina fires. Um, next slide. These are just examples of various incidents around Seattle. So uh, vehicle fires, one thing I've noticed on a couple of fires, usually the engine driver should turn on the phone proportioner prior to charging the line. Sometimes they charge the line first, then turn on the phone proportioner. We've run into magnesium flare-ups in the steering columns or other uh, elements of the vehicle. Once the foam hits the nozzle and gets onto the fire, the magnesium uh, fires uh, die off and uh, we get rapid extinguishment. Next slide. Um, helicopter crash uh, was successful extinguishment. We had a running uh, fuel fire going for a block and a half. Unfortunately, uh, this was a fatality, but we were able to extinguish it prior to all of the aluminum melting away. Uh, they had a quick knockdown on the, the initial attack line. Next slide. Marina fires, we've had quite a few of those. The harder ones are in covered moorage. Um, so that ends up being uh, a fight from the land side and a fight from the water side with the fire boats. Next slide. And we do use uh, our single foam product on all of our firefighting pumper apparatus as well as all of our large and small platform fire boats. You can see the foam runoff there. Um, our regulatory agencies, it's more patchwork here in the U.S. We've got EPA nationally, but then different states have their own regulations. Uh, so we have the State Department of Ecology and Seattle Public Utilities kind of administers uh, reporting uh, for waterfront incidents and runoff to the State Department of Ecology. And within the navigable waterways, we also have U.S. Coast Guard. So uh, we report to multiple agencies. Next slide. Okay, uh, that's a repeat one. Next slide, please. So uh, we did have to train our personnel that foam wasn't a magic bullet, like I mentioned earlier, under a collapsed house and uh, water repellent roof. The foam's not going to magically uh, extinguish the burning debris. This was a ship fire we had with multiple containers uh, on fire and smoldering. Uh, we ended up uh, cooling externally and then using the container cranes to move the material down to the ground level, cut access holes, filled up the containers, and they were still smoldering. Uh, despite the hard work, um, we still had to dump them out and overhaul it just like you would expect for wild land or structural incidents. Next slide. So just in review, uh, as we did for our personnel, uh, the foam we currently use, and similar foams as well, uh, that we compared ours to. Um, ours is rated for A, D, and K fires, used at 0.4%. Next slide. For hydrocarbon and uh, alcohol fires, uh, we use it at 0.5% for the manufacturer. Next slide. Um, our manufacturer says 1% is the maximum portioning rate that the uh, that the efficacy of the foam uh, actually drops off if we use too much of it uh, in ratio with the water. Next slide. Um, so we can use it for structural coating uh, when deployed to wildland incidents. We can up the proportion for extreme incidents or uh, perhaps class B fires with heavy rain. Not that we ever get rain here in Seattle. And next slide. It's just an example of the foam proportioning units uh, that we got on our engines. Foam tank, uh, a uh, inject valve with a foam pump motor, uh, a meter, and uh, then the various waterways uh, that we can send our foam solution to. Next slide. So uh, currently our structural engines are able to deploy at least two hand lines. Next slide. Two hand lines or a uh, large hand line and a ground monitor and uh, flow adequate foam to support both of those at incidents. Next slide. Okay, there you go. That's the end.
So again, uh, not as deep in, not at all deep into the uh, chemical issues, but boots on the ground kind of look. For us, uh, we increased our foam capabilities, have lower concerns over environmental issues, and really didn't have to do much in the way of training or change our procedures. So it's been a win-win for us, um, and uh, I don't, we wouldn't go back. So, all right. That's Thank it. you so much. Thank you, Kurt. Great. Um, our next speaker is Neil Ramston with Last Fire. Last Fire is a consortium of international oil companies developing best practices for storage tank fire hazard management. And Neil is an independent consultant and coordinator for Last Fire and has extensive experience running fire performance tests and demonstrations. Take it away, Neil. Okay, thanks, Jen. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, just a quick bit on what Last Fire is. It's a consortium, as Jen mentioned, of international oil companies. Uh, we develop best practice standards in fire hazard management, not just fire response, but the big issue right now, of course, is foam and uh, foam application. So that's 99% of our work is out at the moment. Just to give you uh, the sort of companies that are there are uh, Shell, BP, ExxonMobil, Caltex, Chevron, um, an apology, Old Marathon have just joined. It is truly global. Next slide, please. Just a, a quick add a bit, you know, I've been around the business an awful long time. And I want to just point out a couple of other things. Many years ago, I used to work for foam companies, so I know the tricks of the trade in testing. I'm also a member of the NFPA 11 committee. I've been there for 25 years or so. Um, for those of you who are fire responders, you'll know NFPA 11 is basically the one that's used to determine how much foam you apply to different types of incident, that type of thing. And of course, I've been in last fire, a last fire project coordinator for many years. But uh, it's not all just theoretical. If you go to the next slide, I've also had a lot of major incident foam application experience. Uh, next slide, Jen, please. Oh, uh, that bit, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, the, the Bunsfield fire we had in the States, which was around uh, 23 tanks ignited simultaneously. I was there for extended periods, for example. It's a, a massive amount of foam was used, and a lot of downstream of the incident consequences were caused because of it. Um, where we are now, uh, well, there's a lot of information out there and an even greater amount of misinformation. Uh, the information on the uh, application and effectiveness of fluorine foam fluorine free foam is not always independent and it's certainly not end user led in a lot of cases. Obviously you've got to work with suppliers but unfortunately you have to do your own test to make sure that uh, the information you get, the data you define your uh, policies on is relevant to your needs. Next please. Uh, and of course different applications need different needs. The last speaker sort of pointed it out but it's even more important once you get to really massive incidents like large storage tank fires. Next one please. Uh, yeah, at the end of the day, what's the most important thing we need from a foam? It's fairly obvious. Next slide, it's, um, it's to extinguish a fire. And if we obviously want to test it before we do it. So next slide, please, Jen. That is the ideal fire test. But unfortunately, uh, if you just carry on a couple of these um, animations to the end of the slide, I think it's pretty better. That does tend to be very expensive. And whatever people think, and I know there's been several cases in the States recently at ITC, and there's an ethanol fire over on the West Coast, and indeed another one in South America, an ethanol fire just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, actually, the industry is pretty good at preventing these. So to get real world experience, a new generation foam is gonna take a long time. Next slide, please. The research work that we're doing uh, is very extensive. It has, you know, it's all about different applications. The application we're dealing with mostly is storage tank fires, like that one that's in Gibraltar, I think, several years ago. Uh, that is a completely, next, next one again, please, Jen. Completely different application to aircraft trash fires, for example. Different phone characteristics, different application techniques, different priorities, of course. The one on the right is blatantly obvious, it's life safety. The one on the left is all about asset protection, business protection, reputation, and so on. So each of these, again, just flick through a couple of the points here, Jen. Next one, please. Yeah, you therefore need to look at different fire tests. For example, this fire test we have developed, well, I say we, as last fire, it was actually initially developed by mobile many years ago, recognizing that standard tests, which are okay for general purpose, things like UL, are not really adequate for some special applications like storage tank fires. So they 
developed the last fire test, we took it over and um, finished the development of it, if you like. The whole point is to make that test pan small scale, obviously, so it's uh, you can do it on a regular basis and it's reasonably cost effective, but it's got to be relevant. Just to give you an idea, the last fire test pan on the left, we run that for three minutes pre-burn, which everything gets much hotter, and the CAP 168, which is uh, one used for um, uh, military and uh, aviation use in Europe, and indeed the MILF one is very similar, the one that's used for aviation use in the States, completely different pan, you don't get hot metal in the same way, you get a lower pre-burn and so on. So it's very important to choose a fire test that's really relevant and then validate it for large scale. And in FPA, Right now, there's a research foundation doing a lot of testing using UL, and there's going to be a lot of questions that raised about UL and the relevance it has to certain applications. Next slide, please. All right, so what was our objective? To provide a firm basis for future cost-effective, sustainable solutions. You've already mentioned, I think Ian mentioned that, uh, and indeed Nigel mentioned that, uh, you, know, you don't want to have a regret spend that you change to something like a new C6 formulation, and then find out in two or three years time, you can't use that either. The other critical thing about our work is it's independent and user driven. We as a last our project coordinator run it, but it's actually managed, if you like, by the, uh, the end users, the teams, uh, the, the company members. Next one, please. Right, so what did we do? We started off with small scale work using the last fire test pan. That is done at very critical application rates. It's about a 50 square foot fire, five square meters. And when I say critical application rate, it's done at a rate much lower than you'd use in practice if you design in accordance with NFPA 11. We then moved on to spill fires. So it's a smaller pan, similar size, 50 square feet. Then we went up to 200 square feet, that type of thing. Again, at critical application rates. We tested at these stages, I think four fluorine freeze, two C6s, we also compared them with two C8s, older ones, just as a you know, like validation against a previously available phones. Having done all that, and if you like, selected the best phones for the next stage, we went to real life applications. So these are storage tank fires using the same phone still as well, though, in, in general. But here we actually applied it to what you design an NFPA application rate. So for example, those that little one in the middle is a tank fire test. It's 11 meters, so around 35 foot diameter. And we're applying it so we get 0.16 GPM per square foot on the surface of the fire. Standard as you design exactly in accordance with NFPA. We then wanted to prove, or, or by the way, we've got good results, but we went to go bigger. So we then wanted to prove will foam actually flow longer distances, because some of these tanks nowadays will be 350, or, or feet diameter. And we did some testing uh, cooperation with Dallas Fort Worth Airport, the ref, um, research and training center down there. And those tests went up. The biggest ones we did were around 40 meters, that's about 150 foot flow tests. And again, very successful. Comparing at each stage, different phones, different application techniques, some aspirated, some non-aspirated, some compressed air foam. We used different application rates. We used different fuels as well throughout the different tests, different pre-burn times and fresh and salt waters. We then went on, if you go over to the left-hand side, we also used foam subsurface. For those of you who are responsible for um, storage tank protection, one method is to pump the foam at the bottom of the tank, very forceful application, and everybody said, fluid freeze won't work for this application. Well, we did, it worked, okay, it's only a, about a five meter, 15 foot, 18 foot tank, but it worked at typical application rates. We've also tried new techniques, because unfortunately the standards tend to be very restrictive in what you can and cannot do. Though NFPA 11 has a equivalency clause in it, it's very difficult to prove equivalency. So we try to do that with other techniques. Self-expanding foam is one that is marketed around the world. It's one that's uh, a pre-mix of foam solution pressurized with CO2, for example. And yeah, we tried that. We also tried something called hybrid. Somebody's already mentioned medium expansion foam. This is, you know, when you're trying to throw medium expansion foam 300 feet, it's difficult. So this particular application uses low expansion foam to carry the medium expansion foam further, for example. And then we've done further dike area fires, uh, obstructed fires, long pre fires there. So all in all, if you go to the next slide, we've done a huge amount of work, undoubtedly more than anybody else in users have done. We've done around 200 or more tests. 
We've validated the extrapolation of test data from large scale testing, uh, from small scale testing, last fire plan to large scale for storage tank application. But a very important thing is, and this, this has always been true, I've been long enough in the business, long enough to see all these things happen. And some of the stuff that's out there right now, we haven't really been doing very well, but it worked. Now we have to learn, relearn things. And one of the things, you cannot be generic. There are good fluorine free foams out there, there are bad fluorine free foams. In exactly the same way, there used to be good AFFS out there and bad AFFS. It's no different, but it's even more obvious right now. Next one, please, Jen. So what would we say is missing? We would say we want to do much larger scale polar solvent tests. Yes, some has been done. It's just good to see what Kurt has just come up with there and what E-Tank Fire did in uh, Sweden some years ago. But we do need larger scale tests. And what happened in uh, California the other day and what's happened just in Brazil more recently shows a need for that. And again, the industry has claimed things about alcohol resistant AFFS in the past about how good they are, but ultimately, They've all got a problem. The more gently you apply them, the better it is. And some of them don't work. They work, they pass a test, but they don't work in the real world when you have to apply them very forcefully. We're still interested in a bit more testing of dry chemical compatibility, because a lot of places you use dry chemical to knock down the fire and then have foam to secure it. We're also interested, because of the way the industry went, and one particular company pushed this with their foam, was using big fire monitors up to, you know, 10,000 GPM, this sort of thing, and we're able to fire the foam a long distance using non aspirated foam. Well, obviously, ideally, people would like to transfer to similar equipment to get the same sort of thing with fluorine free foam. So, it'd be nice to do that to actually do these large scale tests, but as you can imagine, they're very expensive and very time consuming and difficult to organize. It looks as if in uh, quarter one next year in France, we will have a test pit just around 50 meters, so what's 188, 180 foot long, that will be under our control and be able to use it quite a lot. But equally, there's some possibilities in Russia and Hungary as well, up to about 50 meters. Uh, we want to do other phone combinations because just commercially, we don't want to just say, well, these two or three phones are good. We want a more commercially um, uh, competitive market out there. Next slide, please. Other issues, just to say, some companies within the group have already made partial transition and have committed to full transition, undoubtedly, already. You know, they'd like a bit more testing, but they, they, they are going to do it. Simple as that. Next one, please. So, yeah, we all know, I think we, yeah, uh, one of the slides that Ian showed, sort of head in the sand type of thing, or head in the ice in that case, I think. Yeah, we all know fluorosurfactants give special properties, yes, and it gave some very useful properties to foam. But the fact is, we're probably not going to be able to, well, we're not going to be able to use these in the future. So therefore, forget all how good they were, can we live without them? And certainly by all the work we're doing, even for the large incidents, we can do that. But we'd still like to demonstrate it. We're not saying we're not sure it'll work, we want to be able to demonstrate it for certain circumstances. So that's where we are. Next slide, Jen. So our conclusion, we've achieved a lot. We're confident we can do the next stages, but we've just got to do it. So our mind, it's not a crisis as a lot of people claim this is. It's actually an opportunity to get a lot of things right that really we've been getting away with for the last 20, 30 years with certain types of fun. So um, that's really where we are. So, uh, so a lot of huge amount of work and anybody who wants to, well, copies of uh, slides are going to be put on the web anyway, but equally, if you go to the last of our website, we can also, or and contact us, we can also give you some of our guidance documents on how to manage your foam stock. We're calling it uh, you know, like a self-audit um, technique called cradle to grave, which is really just from procurement of the foam to disposal. Are you doing these things properly? Uh, even if you're still using a C6 or you're moving to a furry free, you should be managing in that way. So there's other deliverables you can get and download from the last five website. So thank you very much uh, for listening. I know it's a lot of stuff to cover in a few minutes, but hopefully it's whetted at it, appetites about the work that last is doing anyway. There'll be a lot more done next year as well. Thank you, Neil. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is Peter Storch, who's a chemical engineer with over 25 years of experience in environmental engineering, working in the US, Europe, and for the last 10 years in Australia. He's a principal engineer for Arcadis in Melbourne and is focused recently on the clean out of fluorinated foam supply systems and the transition to fluorine-free foam. 
to Peter. Uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, what I'd like to do is just share some of, some of the ideas and, and certainly the challenges that we've encountered in uh, working through some foam transition projects. And um, yeah, I'll touch on, on foam selection, accreditation, um, system modifications that are that are almost always necessary and uh, and and certainly clean out of these systems um, when converting from um, from a triple up to uh, to uh, a replacement foam so uh, this is from the environmental engineering perspective and uh, I certainly have had a lot to learn about uh, fire systems um, and have gotten a lot of help in that area uh, but one of the first things I realize is how diverse fire suppression foam systems really are uh, from a, from industrial uh, bladder tank systems feeding uh, feeding sprinklers um, to to mobile systems that the fire and rescue are using um, to to large um, atmospheric tanks uh, being with with large concentrate pumps you know feeding aircraft hangar uh, fire suppression systems. Um, to helipads, uh, to even the small uh, small foam systems uh, protecting uh, mining vehicles, you know, heavy equipment. So uh, the diversity is actually pretty amazing, and every every foam change out therefore um, has a different set of challenges. So if you go to the next slide, um, I, I'll just mention a, a few things about foam selection, and it certainly certainly this is the first big issue to be addressed when um, when looking at foam transition is what 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 am I going to replace my my current foam with and um, and and the, certainly the big decision as uh, um, uh, Niall and and, um, and and Idol and others have mentioned is that uh, is, is it flooring free or is it um, a C6 and certainly uh, some of the parameters that that we've been considering in this in this process uh, availability um, it certainly found that, that foreign free foams are available and, and if they're available in Australia uh, I certainly think that that that's not an issue in the US uh, UK Europe um, and so so there has been a good selection of, of foams to consider uh, performance as we've been hearing is of course, of course, a, a, a critical consideration, um, and uh, product testing is, you know, it has to be considered for accreditation for for insurance, um, and and this is where often we, we we've actually run into some some issues recently, uh, in in that uh, there isn't as much testing um, with with uh, polar solvent applications, um, and and uh, uh, and in some cases, that A Triple F actually showed showed uh, um, you know more opportunities there, but certainly something that has to be considered. Um, and then there's almost always modifications to be made, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But but certainly both foreign free and modern uh, and, and C6 A Triple F are are new to the market, um, so so they all have that. They all have issues that need to be considered. Uh, to go to the next slide, just a, a few other um, selection uh, considerations uh, on the environmental side. Certainly, foreign free has the the uh, advantage of, of biodegradability. Um, they are biodegradable, uh, and uh, C6, you'll still be dealing with with the persistent um, PFAS. Um, containment, waste disposal, um, certainly more options with the fluorine free foam. In fact, we're right, we, we now have precedence for discharge of uh, proportion foam, uh, uh, test foam mix being discharged to sewer, um, which, uh, which, which is certainly not going to be the case for, a, uh, for an AFFF. Um, Overall, we see you know the environmental liability using a fluorine-free foam greatly reduced, um, 
and uh, we're pleasantly surprised in some of our costing to, to find that uh, very competitive unit costs. Um, and uh, as, as has been mentioned, uh, the, the question out there is, uh, is the C6 a regret spend? Next slide. So in terms of uh, accreditation, I won't go into much detail here, but, but it's certainly a big issue uh, to be uh, worked through with insurance, uh, your, your insurance uh, provider. And um, accreditation really applies uh, not just to the foam, but how the foam, wh what type of fuel and type of fire you're gonna be fighting. Um, and uh, the specific equipment um, are, uh, are the various components of your system um, cross-listed with your foam um, and and uh, been tested with your foam, whether it's an aspirated or non-aspirated system, um, et cetera, it needs, it needs to be considered. Um, and then in the end, is a, is a fire engineer going to, uh, you know, approve these modifications? And um, there, there may not be a lot of uh, formal certification around this, this process uh, with, with foam transition. Um, however, certainly this provides a, a you know, fire engineering's approval in the end is a is, is a is a critical um, step. So if we go to the next slide, um, system modifications that certainly um, have to be considered in um, in, in in assessing cost. Um, and uh, changing proportioner uh, foam proportioners where where you're actually mixing the concentrate in your water streams to create your foam um, is, is an is an important component and and almost needs almost always needs to be changed and certainly we found that that getting a getting a tested certified proportioner um, you know with the foam that you've selected uh, is a it, is often the best way to go. Um, just the photo, photos on the right show uh, show proportioners and, and concentrate being fed into them into a water stream. So you kind of know what we're talking about. And, and these are in the uh, actually an aircraft uh, hangar um, foam supply system. Um, aspirated versus non-aspirated discharge devices. It's a, a, a what we've found in talking to uh, fire and rescue folks that uh, certainly the calf system uh, compressed air foam systems have been have been really instrumental in in uh, uh, converting to foam and free foam and maintaining performance um, and uh, so so looking at whether you have appropriate pumps to handle a higher vis uh, a foam and free foam with a higher viscosity um, and and then what about your storage tanks? Are you uh, would it, would it be uh, are you going to get better performance converting to a bladder tank system if you don't already have that kind of system? Um, and uh, your foam application rate, of course, plays into how large a tank you actually need. Uh, but in overall, there there are modifications that that need to be considered. Um, in, in the in the redesign process. Uh, next slide. So, in making some of these critical decisions, it's uh, very important to have a a, a team with the, with the correct experience and and uh, expertise. And certainly, along the fire engineering side, that's that's clear. You're, you're going to need you're going to need that 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 fire engineering expertise uh, uh, but also the fire contractor on the ground and the fire service engineer uh, to, to help with the with the detailed uh, redesign um, and um, what we found works most um, uh, successfully has been has been incorporating environmental engineering into that design process uh, bringing in an understanding of PFAS and how how PFAS 
um, are behaving in, in these piping systems. Um, and, um, and, 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 and this plays into several things, including PFAS cleanup. Um, and then we, we certainly know that waste characterization disposal uh, is a cost driver. Um, and, um, and, and then finally understanding what kind of containment are you going to need um, to improve your, uh, reduce your environmental liability. Next slide. And there's just the, the kicker. Go ahead. Next, just to summarize that. Um, so other transitions, um, considerations, of course, um, uh, impact of business. Um, how, how long is your system going to be down? Uh, overall cost. Looking at long-term costs is certainly is, is critical. Um, clean out versus replacement. How many of these components um, are, are, are worth considering for clean out, uh, or can they be easily replaced? Um, PFAS rebound has been a um, kind of a current issue that we've we've encountered, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and uh, clean out strategy is a is a is also something that that um, needs to be considered well considered during kind of the design process. Um, so, so that, uh, that, that you're getting the best, uh, actually you're, you're getting the benefit of your new foam and, uh, not, not recontaminating it. So next slide. So is clean out essential? Well, as, uh, as Ian Ross was, was, was showing us that we, we PFAS do, um, do tend to bind to surfaces in layers, uh, making them very difficult to remove. And, and however, uh, the binding isn't permanent. And certainly, what we've seen is over time that, that PFAS will work its way back into um, solutions in, in, a, in, a, in a piping system, um, and cr in effect creating this rebound. Um, we found that that essentially a water Water flush, certainly a short lived flush, uh, isn't very effective in removing this PFAS. Um, and I'll show you a little bit of data on that. Um, the, the, uh, um, I, I think in the end, what we've found is that uh, a cleaning agent is, uh, provides a more effective uh, process and uh, as well as agitation, it's shown to be quite effective. Next slide. So here's a uh, two short case studies showing some data from um, the first one was actually a sewer decontamination trial, um, and the graph on the left shows P PFOS in nanograms per liter um, for some various uh, flushing steps of a, uh, a sewer piping system. So why why is a sewer um, analogy um, uh, relevant to uh, to foam transition. Well, this was actually impacted with concentrate, um, and uh, a, a sewer system was actually impacted with a with a concentrate release, and uh, therefore it it actually simulated very much a uh, uh, cleaning out a concentrate system. And one thing what we what this graph shows essentially is that until we got to the flushing step where we actually used the cleaning agent, um, we, we didn't see a lot of mass coming off of these rinses. Um, and uh, again, this is just PFOS, but um, because it kind of highlighted uh, that, that once you did use the cleaning agent, um, the, the, the levels in, in, in the residual water in the final water flush was quite, were quite low. Um, in a similar manner, uh, we, we actually did a trial on a, a large stainless steel uh, foam concentrate tank, um, and, and the graph on the right shows total PFAS versus, uh, again, the flushes. Um, and there was a baseline water flush from the tank. Um, and what we're showing here is, is actually the, the pre-top assay result and the post-top assay result. 
um, in green. So the standard analysis uh, picked up uh, relatively low nanogram per liter levels. Of, um, however, once you run the top assay, as we know, uh, you, you see the, the real mass of PFAS, uh, or at least a, a, a better quantification of it. Um, and you could see the mass that was taken off with the cleaning agent, um, which resulted in a, uh, a final water flush that uh, was, was, was significantly reduced. However, uh, do note that, that, that it wasn't zero. Um, and uh, with, with the, but without the cleaning agent, I don't, I don't think uh, we would we would have come near near that uh, that that kind of performance, and with PFAS removal. So next slide. So in terms of PFAS rebound, uh, there's a quite a quite an interesting um, result was re re recently. Um, observed uh, essentially in 2018, uh, a large aircraft hangar in Australia was went through a foam change out. Uh, they did do a, a, a two water flush on on lines to the extent possible. Uh, so these were concentrate lines, um, foam mix lines, um, and and um, essentially this is um, this was a a, an extensive fire suppression system um, with with foam concentrate feeding um, monitors in the hangar, uh, as well as a deluge system and and uh, um, uh, foam hose reels, for example. Um, the uh, we then went one year later, 2019. Uh, we did an extensive um, uh, investigation into PFAS residual and and uh, we found levels up to 1.6 grams per liter uh, in our fluorine-free foam. So um, essentially, the fluorine-free foam, when it was first changed out, was sampled, and and there were there were very very um, small detections of PFAS. However, a year later, the levels were were, were quite significant. Um, and what's shown in the graph on the right is essentially top assay results on a log scale. Uh, for various points throughout the, the concentrate supply system. Um, Peter, this is and, Jen. I just want to let everyone know that we are coming close to the end of um, the allotted time, but because we're recording this, if folks need to leave, then they can come and see the rest of your presentation. So I want to let you continue, and then folks can go ahead and post their questions, and we can also um, put out into on IC2's website, some Q&A. So you can go ahead. We want to try to wrap up within the next, I don't know, 10 minutes or so, though. OK, great. Thanks, thanks, Jen. Um, and I'm almost finished. So the, the, the other takeaway message from this investigation was that uh, the, it wasn't just the concentrate and the foam mix lines that were impacted. It was also the fire water supply system. So if you go to the next slide, um, there's a case study where we actually uh, uh, have sampled uh, before a foam transition to understand if, if the fire water, of course, was an issue uh, with this system. And this is a, 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 a um, smaller hangar uh, foam supply system, it has a fire water tank up in the left hand corner. Um, a supply line to the to the to the fire water pump, um, and if you go to the next slide, I'll just add one more click. Okay, and that that shows. Oh, I'm sorry. If you go go back one, Jen. There, there's uh so so it does show um, it it does show where the sampling that we did. Um, the highlighted in the blue circles is the um, uh, it, it are the alarm check valves. Um, our under, our our uh, conclusion from from analyzing PFAS throughout the system was that uh, that those alarm check valves were were actually allowing um, intermittent backflow, uh, which could be allowing PFAS impacted foam in uh, fluids back you know into the fire water system. 
Um, so we've investigated five, um, five systems in this manner and found four of them impacted. So it's a, it's a, um, uh, it's an indication that that's a consideration that should be, should be, um, included in any, any foam transition work. Uh, so just to wrap up my final slide, um, certainly what we've seen is that foreign free foams, they're performing, they're available, uh, they're cost effective, particularly if you're considering long-term environmental liabilities. Um, you know, however, there are modifications to it that, that are going to be need, need to be made to systems. Um, and you need a, you need a good qualified team. Uh, looking at that process. Uh, top acid is a critical tool in assessing PFAS foams and, and, uh, you know, certainly an effective decontamination process is going to help preserve the benefits of your, of your foreign free foam. Uh, but it is, it is happening and, uh, successfully. Uh, certainly firefighting services throughout Australia, uh, and it's good to hear in, in Seattle, uh, have, have made, made the, uh, the jump and, um, um, you know, ABA, the aviation uh, industry has certainly embraced this in Australia, um, and, and bulk storage facilities and chemical manufacturers are coming along. And I would like to just commend uh, the government of Queensland and, and certainly Nigel's team for their leadership in in, in, in moving towards the conversion um, practice and 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 really taking a practical approach. Um, in, in working with, with industry and uh, foam users. So thank you very much. And then Ian is going to just wrap it up with a few disposal considerations. Yeah, I just got three slides. I'll be pretty quick. So the next slide, please. Um, I think to point out that, um, you know, firefighting foam concentrate and the dispensed foam uh, comprise a pretty complex waste. Uh, the fluorinated foams like AFFF, FFFP, et cetera, cannot be treated in biological treatment processes. So municipal sewage treatment plants or POTWs, anything that's biological will not treat PFASs, the fluorosurfactants in the foam. Um, you may convert them to things that are regulated, but they're extremely persistent, so they're not treatable using any biological technique. <clears throat> and that's not the same for the fluorine-free foams. Once you've got some green screen certification and proved that uh, they are 100% biodegradable, they're much easier to treat through a conventional biological wastewater treatment plant. So what you see in the foams is a mixture of um, things like glycols at, at high percentage concentrations with some surfactants. Uh, this one's up to 15% of um, a, a perfluoroalkyl surfactant, a PFAS. And there's many things that can be in foams, but the thing that is of concern when you're thinking about treatment of the foams is the PFAS, the fluorosurfactants, as they will not be treated via the biological methods. So the next slide, please. So incineration is really the, the, the main option that we've seen for uh, disposal of foam concentrates. And uh, I've seen Nigel certainly talking about cement kilns. Incineration needs to be above 1,000 degrees C to de degrade PFOS. Uh, anything lower than that has got the potential to make toxic intermediates. So we see um, more information out on perfluoroisobutylene, which is uh, a nerve gas that um, is not particularly pleasant so uh, and there's also potent greenhouse gases can come off from lower temperature incineration and so we certainly recommend that some comprehensive analysis of all gaseous emissions are carried out for thermal treatment to just double check what is coming out of the stack especially if it's below a thousand degrees c and the next slide so with complex wastes there are ways of treating firefighting foam concentrates and dispensed foam that are evolving. And the, the concern is the other organics in there. So we've set up some treatment trains to destroy PFAS. And the main thing we're seeing is um, we can knock out the glycols and the other organics pretty easily. And then we put it into something called um, sonolysis, which is caused by ultrasound. And this creates plasma, uh, extremely high temperatures just on the surface of the bubbles, not in the main bulk fluid which is destroying PFAS. So if we just go to the next, we'll see that we've got a, a pretty perfect fluoride mass balance coming off just off PFOS in solution here, where we've shown we can definitely convert it 
all the way through to fluoride as opposed to any hydrogen fluoride we can keep the ph high and we get some clean conversion and the next slide is some data where we've taken a complex waste coming from a treatment process and we've then pre-treated it and uh, then it's gone into a sonolytic process and at the moment we're accepting um, different waste types for some sonolysis and um, associated technologies that will be in a treatment train to destroy foam concentrates so if anyone is interested in sending us some samples we can uh, start working on those for free at the moment we have got some funding from um, some foam manufacturers but we're very keen to receive samples and get this up and running we'd like to get some kind of commercial system for foam concentrate destruction running in the next couple of years where we can scale up this whole process and get something that is going to be much more cost effective doesn't need high temperature incineration and fundamentally is more sustainable as a way of destroying these foam concentrates and um, and also dispensed foam okay that's it i think the next slide is just questions Great, thank you. Thank you, Ian, and thank you to all of our presenters. I know that Topher has seen about seven to eight questions from the audience. And so since we are over time, what we thought we would do is uh, put those out to our presenters and ask them to reply, and then we can post the Q&A to the IC2 website. So Topher, I don't know if you want to wrap up. Anything else? No, I mean, I. That was fantastic, and again, I just want to extend my thanks on behalf of the IC2 to the presenters, and I definitely want to acknowledge you, Jen, for doing most of the legwork to organize this, so thank you so much. This has been a really interesting uh, presentation. Thanks. Well, thank you, and thank you, presenters. I have learned a lot, and I have to re-watch the webinar again so I can absorb everything. It's been a, a lot of information, and I'm sure many of us have much more to learn. So thank you, and thank you to all the audience members for sticking with us through the entire entirety of this, and we will be in touch soon. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Bye-bye.